Why don't we just cover very quickly sure. your take on creatine? Yeah, you know, my colleagues and I did a systematic review and meta-analysis on site-specific uh, changes in muscle mass according to creatine supplementation. Site-specific? Like, yeah. Instead of looking at gross body composition, fat mass, lean mass, we looked at things like MRI and uh, things like muscle thickness. Mm. And so we're, we're actually looking at the muscle itself. Okay, so um, creatine, it, it produces really small effects. Mm. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, mm. uh, the, the effects were very small. And this led a lot of folks to read our systematic review and conclude that, okay, well, creatine is kind of useless. We limited our data to the ultrasound stuff and MRI stuff. The fact of the matter is when you're done with a creatine loading phase, you are going to gain as much as 2% of your total body weight mm. uh, as lean mass. And yes, that is going to be um, a certain amount of water. Uh, mostly water. It's going to be intramuscular water. But that can provide anabolic leverage in, leverage, the, in the long yes. term. Yes. And not only that, when you look at the body of literature on strength gains with creatine versus placebo, mm -hmm. creatine strength gains over the course of uh, a few weeks, maybe an average study in like 8 to 12 weeks, you're looking at 20% increase in strength with the creatine group and 12% increase with the placebo group. So that substantial advantage in strength gains over time mm. is going to translate ultimately to significant advantages in size gains. And so just because we put out that dang systematic review and meta-analysis and made everybody not believe in creatine anymore, mm. I, as one of the co-authors, will tell you, no, that's not the interpretation. Mm. The interpretation is, well, creatine is not necessarily magic or going to give you steroid-like gains, but it still works, and I still definitely recommend it. Yeah, look, it helps and evidently with cell energy metabolism, and I think it's the same across the board. You've just said a word that I'm going to start using when I refer to creatine as leverage. Mm. You know, you are really leveraging mm. your brain to communicate more effectively, you know, from neuron to neuron. You've got more brain energy, and it's the same with your muscles. You know, so it's um, it's not the fact that it's just going to induce um, muscle protein synthesis, but it's going to help you maybe lift heavier. Yeah, that's an overlooked it. part of it. Yeah. 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 Um, and dosages, are you sticking to the, let, let's just say, five grams per day to start yep, with? Yeah, that's right about the sweet spot that'll work yeah. for most people. You can argue that smaller folks would need less, like three-ish grams, mm. but roughly three to five grams a day is going to do it. You can argue that very large folks could benefit towards the seven, eight mm. grams a day in order to support extraordinary lead large muscle mass. So Yeah. And the good thing is because I interviewed Dr. Darren Kandel, um, mm. the interesting thing is there is no age limit restriction. Yeah. It doesn't destroy your kidneys. It doesn't increase DHT, which increases hair loss. Right, um, right. It doesn't do anything bad. It doesn't bloat you, make you be, well, sometimes maybe you can experience bloating, but that's with anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I know that there is a, it doesn't matter as you get older, but like when can, like what's the youngest? I yeah, guess? yeah, yeah. So the, the limits with that question are kind of the ethics approval with certain, ex, you know, certain lines of research. It's just like, well, I don't think we'll ever know truly how advantageous anabolic steroids are compared to the natties mm. because- We'll never get the ethics approval for that. Yeah, um, it's kind of the same thing would would go with with creatine. We ha we have to kind of rely on this observational data and see whether creatine is doing bad things for for children and adolescents, and it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> so observationally, yeah, creatine just seems to be perfectly safe. Yeah, it's the most widely studied supplement, and I would say the safest. Um, so the other supplement that I advocate for um, when I, I speak about supplementation outside of blood work is omega-3 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely wonderful. I think they've got the safety profile of an FDA-approved drug, but 
they just do so much. You get so much bang for your buck. And I know that there is a, I forget who the author was, but I was reading a study um, about omega-3 fatty acids inducing muscle protein synthesis mm-hmm. or not inducing, maybe mm-hmm. I, I guess helping with mm-hmm. muscle mass and muscle Mus- strength. Muscle adaptations to training, yeah. Uh, my friend Jeffrey Heilson um, is one of the active researchers okay. in that area. I need to re- I need to interview him. Yeah, he's 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 a great guy. Okay, you're gonna he's, have to do the setup. Oh yeah I'll, yeah, I'll introduce you guys. He he is salt of the <sighs> earth. He's a good guy. I am obsessed. I have to say, with omega three fatty acids. Um, just to preface this, um, it's twenty percent of the total lipids in the brain are made from DHA, mm. which is one of the three components or three parts of omega three fatty acids. See, it's doubling. You're you're getting the brain benefits, but you're also getting the muscle adaptations from it. Yeah, it, it is a multitasking. Good thing. Um, and it's interesting, you know, we, we can look at population data and see these marine communities doing so well in so many areas of health and their omega-3 intake is is uh, one of the big contributors to that. You know, the controversy of, of omega-3 official official supplementation right now is that will it cause atrial fibrillation beyond oh, a certain yeah, dose? It's, and that's there was mainly, a new, That was a late st- a study that just came out. Yeah. 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 And, and so I actually uh, talked to Jeffrey... Heilson mm-hmm. about about that, and he's very skeptical of the um, that conclusion, especially based on the the data, which is mostly observational, and there it, it's tough to mechanistically connect the dots of how this could be biologically plausible. Um, and so, but a, as with anything, it's like, what's the trade off? Let's say you're afraid of omega threes now. What are you, what kind of other risks are you going to incur down the line cardiovascularly if you tiptoe around maybe an optimal intake of omega three fatty acids? Um, so yeah, there's there's trade offs to consider. Mm. But look, it, all in all, it's a it, if you can get a good high quality supplement, you know, look at the manufacturing mm. of any supplement that you take. Really, if you can, it's really it, it it will serve you well in the long run. Right, and you look at populations who eat a lot of fatty fish. It's not like they've got this high atrial fibrillation prevalence or something. You know, no. Like, 